I'll make no order. First of all, we would like to welcome everyone to the Jackson County Board of Education Administration Building and our April 18th regular meetings. Before we get started, we actually had a board employee who passed away on April 2nd. Uh, Patricia Corning, we all knew her as Patty. Uh, Patty was a really good person. She was also an excellent employee. She was very good at her job. So if everybody would, let's please have one moment of silence for her. All right, first I want to give you a little inf uh, information about our RT Tiger program. The RT Tigers is an after school arts program that meets once a week from 3.30 to 5. And during these meetings, most all forms of art can be found. Love enjoys creating in music, drama, dance, and the visual arts. RC Tigers began in 2016 with Ms. Lisa Young, a third grade teacher with a passion for art. She felt there was a need for students with a creative mind to have an outlet. Since then, third, fourth, and fifth grade students have created in multiple art forms. The club begins the year with visual projects until time to prepare for the Christmas performance. At that time, students practice a play where they will be acting, singing, dancing, making props, working on the set, and performing for the school. A spring concert play is held in the spring, along with several visual art projects um, to round out the year. Through the years, Archie Tigers have enjoyed guest artists provided by Artists for All Kentucky. During some of these visits, students have learned about and created fiber art focused on their heritage, such as quilts, wall paintings, scarves, and more. They also had a visit from a performing artist where they learned about instruments and songs from their culture. Students sang, played instruments, and wrote their own songs. Artsy Tigers have also enjoyed guest artists from their community, such as teachers and parents. Many people have helped to make Artsy Tigers successful over the years. The club would not exist without their wonderful help. This year they had help from Ms. Cassidy Sparks, Ms. Sandra Jones, as well as Camp AJ volunteers. Artsy Tigers are very thankful for their time and effort in creating a place where creative minds can have an enjoyable artsy experience. Our Artsy Tigers have prepared a performance for you tonight. So at this time, I'll turn it over to them.
way to get started. Um, so I want to thank you all for inviting us. Thank you for having us this evening. I just wanted to go through some of the activities that our students have participated in so far this year at San Gap. Uh, first is going to be the McKee Homecoming Parade back in September. We uh, drew names from each grade level, so two students from each grade level participated. Uh, Ms. Young kind of spearheaded the float. We had people from the state after school and worked hard to get our float together. Um, I had the privilege of driving the float as the tiger. It's kind of difficult to see out of that four inch gap there in the tiger's mouth, so luckily I didn't hit anybody, but uh, that was a very, uh, a very fun day for us. We also participated in the McKee Christmas Parade with our uh, extracurricular teams, and it was dark so I didn't put the tiger head on that night. That was just too dangerous. So, uh, but the kids had a great time. It was cold, but we, uh, we had a good time there in the parade. Uh, for fall festivities, we took several field trips back in September and October. Um, this picture was our fourth and fifth graders that took a trip to Evans Orchard. Uh, and our kindergartners toured through its pumpkin patch. We also took, um, took some trips to Camp AJ. Camp AJ has been a terrific partner to work with San Gap. We have tutors in the school that work with us. Uh, we take field trips up there, and they're great camp counselors. Um, I was able to go on this trip with our second and third graders. They had great stories. They built a campfire and roasted s'mores, and our kids were talking about that for weeks after, uh, after we got back. So that was a terrific trip. As far as our extracurricular activities, we had um, a ton of students come out for all of our teams. We had so many opening night, I let everybody perform, and our gym was packed. I had people standing around the wall. We didn't have places to sit them. So after the first performance, we had to start staggering who could perform. and I didn't have the room to let everybody come. We had so many kids, which is a great problem to have. Um, all that involvement was, was great. Our first picture there is our Tippin' Tigers. They're getting ready to perform at the uh, county tournament. And then beside them there is our dance team. Um, our girls' basketball team had a great season. We, uh, they took a field trip to Memorial Coliseum and got to watch the UK girls play. We're sending three fifth grade girls up to middle school next year. They should be able to join the middle school's team, have an immediate impact, um, and be a benefit as soon as they get there. Our boys' basketball team, very successful. They made a great run in the district tournament. Um, sending several fifth graders up to middle school next year, too. Uh, but the middle school is not just getting great athletes, they're getting great kids. These are such great students um, and just good all around people. I mean, we, we've got some of the greatest kids that you'll find anywhere at San Gap. Um, and some great parents. The parents support his kids. But uh, I hate to look, there's a lot of faces there that I, I hate to, to send to the middle school next year. I'm going to miss them. But, um, the middle school is going to be very, very fortunate to get them. Uh, this is our archery team who had a terrific season. Archery team is coached by Mr. Tracy Van Winkle and Mr. Todd Rose. And then our cheerleaders here on the right, they've done a terrific job um, all year cheering on our teams. This slide's our academic team. They made a great run in the uh, district tournament that's held at Tyner. I had several students that placed in several categories. Luke. Dozier, you placed, didn't you? Stand up. I, 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 I didn't place. I, I, I got close. You came close. So I'll take it. I'll still stand up. Right. But I, I do appreciate all of your work. Four points away. Job. You helped us with We're free to call. We're very nice. Um, this Peters coach the team. They had a very successful season. Once again, great group of kids. I was with them pretty much all day at Tyner that day. I got to moderate their matches. Um, and I... I'll throw some, give some credit to the other two elementary schools. We've got some great kids in this county, and our academic team is going to be incredibly strong when you take all three and combine them when they finally get to middle school. So the future is very bright for Jackson County. Uh, we had a Veterans Day performance. We were honored to have the JROTC cadets from the high school, as well as Sergeant Diane Smith. Uh, Ms. Smith served as our guest speaker. She came in and told of her experiences. Um, also gave our students a history lesson on the different branches of the military. Also gave us a quick lesson on um, 
on better to say in general. We had a jam-packed gym, as you can see there. Each grade level performed a song. Uh, each veteran in attendance was recognized for their service. Um, just a, a very positive event, I think, that our guests were honored. And we, we had several that, that came out. We had, uh, I don't remember the exact number of veterans that came, but we, we did have several. We were, we were very glad to get to recognize those. Um, one of our strengths, I think, <coughs> school-wide and county-wide is our, our community partnerships. There's not really anybody that you can't reach out to that won't come and help you in some way. Um, and first off is our mystery reader, uh, Sheriff Hayes, came and read for her kindergarten classes. I was in a meeting with Sheriff Hayes and asked him if he would come and read, and he said this was his busiest time, but he would try to come after Christmas. And I said, well, after Christmas, kindergartners can read. I don't need you then. So he, uh, he did make some time and came early and, and read to our kids. The uh, San Gap Fire Department is always great. They're always willing to come speak with their kids. Um, they bring the fire trucks up. The kids always love that. They let our preschoolers come down and do a tour of the firehouse, which, which they loved. And they, were, they came back wearing their fire hats, and they were, they were very excited. Uh, the Friday before spring break, Sheriff Isaacs came, brought his deputies, and he uh, done a demonstration with the dog, and he passed out the little badge stickers, and uh, the kids had a great time with his, with his presentation. Um, they, they spoke to our kids about the job duties that they have. They talked about drug prevention, other police-related matters. We had our Lemonade War Literacy Night. Uh, the way the Lemonade War worked through the month of March, in the beginning we passed out the Lemonade War book by Jacqueline Davies. Teachers volunteered to read the chapter. They recorded themselves reading it. And then each night we posted the uh, recording on our YouTube and Facebook page. Every kid in the building got a book. So they could either read the book at home with their parents each night or they could watch the recording, whichever they preferred. We would ask questions each morning um, at school. And then if you knew the correct answer, you turned your name in, and we drew for prizes throughout the month. And then our culminating activity was that Lemonade War on March 28th. We had a terrific turnout. Uh, my staff put a ton of work into it to pull it off. Each grade level had a game or activity. It was obviously lemon-themed um, or related back to the book in some way. Uh, there's Miss Bellamy, our Youth Service Center Director. She set up a lemonade stand and passed out lemonade. Uh, terrific event, very positive event. Um, I think our students enjoyed it. Our staff enjoyed setting it up. It was just an all-around, uh, really, really positive night. Um, one of my favorite programs is the Lunch with the Principal program that Miss Bellamy supervises and kind of um, spearheads for us. So at the end of each nine weeks, any student in fourth or fifth grade has a 3.5 or higher GPA gets to go to Dairy Queen, I get to go with them. Um, and we saw the number of students who qualify slowly increase. So that's, uh, that's great. We keep, we keep adding a few each time that rolls around. Um, and I love getting to go out and reward our kids. I love to uh, reward our kids for their hard work because it's hard. Fifth grade is, is difficult. And for those students to, uh, fourth and fifth grade, for those students to qualify on grade level, there's a lot of work that goes into it and they need to be recognized and rewarded for it. Um, so very, very good program there. A uh, few final highlights. Uh, number one is going to be our school resource officer. We're very thankful to have Deputy Sloan with us. Um, it's just great to know that we have him as an added safety measure. Uh, his presence is very welcome at our school. He's walked through and talked to the kids at lunch and went in a few classrooms and uh, just making sure the kids are getting to know him. And he's had a, a great presence so far in the building. Um, the completion of our school roof is <laughs> terrific because when I first took over in August, uh, the rainstorm came. Uh, the custodians and myself were having to take buckets and garbage cans. We knew where the leaks were and we would have to have to catch the drips. But now we don't have anything to worry about. The roof is, is great. It was much needed um, and it's very appreciated by every, everyone in the building. Um, we're very thankful to have to have our new roof. Um, the new preschool playground, if you've not been out to see the playground, it's worth the trip. That's as nice a playground as you'll find anywhere. You can't go to any park anywhere and find a nicer playground. 
Um, the, uh, the brown that you see there, it was laid like concrete. They kind of poured out of, I don't know, it looked like blacktop or something. And then patted it down, but it's soft when you walk on it. It's, uh, you know, there's no wood chips, there's no dirt, there's no mud. It's, uh, and even under the slides, it's softer. The blue part there that you see is softer than the brown part around it. So the uh, number of accident reports coming in from recess has been cut in half based on when they fall on this uh, toward when they fell on what we had before. So very nice playground. I mean, you can, the pictures don't really do it justice. It's worth um, coming out and checking it out if you've not, you've not saw it yet. Um, and there's just the, uh, the preschoolers love these little things. This thing spins. They get in and spin and they, uh, they have a really good time on the playground. So we're very thankful to have, to have it together and, and finally usable. So just in closing, I want to thank each of you for the opportunity to speak tonight, for allowing our students to perform. Um, on behalf of San Gap Elementary, I want to thank each of you for all that you do for our school and for our district. Your hard work and dedication to our students is greatly appreciated, and we are very thankful for your service and your support. Thank you all. Item 2B, 2023 Jackson County Public Schools Summer Success Academy presentation. Ms. Norris, whenever you're ready.
We want to design and deliver in-person instruction based on the student's individual instructional gaps in relation to essential current year grade level content skills and concepts for successful learning at that level. We utilize digital curriculum for no more than 30 minutes per day. Uh, that's often a question that we get is, um, are students just going to be working on the computer? And actually, in our model, we limit that to 30 minutes. And we do that specifically so that it gives uh, the teachers time to work with other students one-on-one. -on -one. We do uh, encourage formative assessment frequently. And then we ask that they do an end-of-program assessment as well. So we begin with a data collection sheet to generate lists of students who have the greatest need. Uh, we have limited personnel who are teaching in our Summer Success Academy, which means we have to have a limited number of seats. So we always start with the students who have the greatest need. And we do that based on the data that we have. We use multiple data points uh, to identify students for participation. And our priority group is, are those students who are scoring in the 30th percentile or below on diagnostic assessment. As I said, it's multiple points of data, so that's one piece of the uh, puzzle. But we're also looking for kids who have failing grades or maybe they don't have any grades due to attendance issues. Um, we want to target students who are in Tier 3. Uh, we want to identify students who have chronic absenteeism or participation issues. And we also look at teacher recommendations so that the student is not prepared to be successful at the next grade level. We really want to use this time to help catch students up so that they can be successful moving forward. In the event that uh, once we identify the, the priority group of students, if we don't fill all of the spots that we have, then we move on to the next group because uh, we want every child that, that we can to have an opportunity to do this. So our secondary caseload are those students who are scoring below the 45th percentile on the diagnostic assessment. They may have average classroom performance, but they may have gaps. Maybe they have trouble specifically with adding and subtracting fractions. And so having targeted instruction on a specific skill may help them to really excel at the next grade level. So we're looking for those kids who may have gaps in knowledge. It may be a kid who makes a B, but it could also be a, a child who's making a C or a D. Uh, this is typically our Tier 2 students. They may have some attendance or participation issues. And once again, we always look at teacher recommendation. Who is a child that's really going to benefit from this extra instruction to help them be successful at the next grade? So once again, these are the diagnostic assessments that we use across the district as the foundation for the list. And once we get the student list, we put that together, uh, looking at our student data, and then we begin to develop uh, individual student learning goals. So we will have two days of training after school is out, <coughs> uh, before summer school begins, and the teachers will come in with their list of their priority uh, students, list of students who've committed to coming, and the teacher will look at that student data and they will begin to identify student learning goals for that child. What is the essential information that child needs to be the uh, most successful student <coughs> that she can be? So the teachers will look at priority standards, which include essential content, essential skills, and essential concepts. And then they'll develop a student learning goal uh, based on that data and it will specify improvement in student learning, growth, and or achievement. And we give them a template that they complete. <coughs> so questions we ask them to think about when they're looking at those individual kids. You know, why is this student here? What are the goals for this specific student? How will I measure that students are making progress towards this goal? And then ultimately, how will I determine whether or not they met the goal that I had for them? So, our daily schedule, uh, staff are on site at 8 o'clock, 
Instruction begins, I'm sorry, breakfast begins at 8.30. Uh, we have 15 minutes. Breakfast is provided to all participants. Uh, then we have our first instructional block for 90 minutes. Then we have an enrichment block. Then we have lunch, uh, also provided um, to all students. Then we have our second instructional block. Then we have a physical activity block. Then we have our third instructional block. Then we have 30 minutes of independent learning or individualized tutoring. And that's the time slot where they could do digital learning if they choose to. Uh, and then uh, we start uh, preparing to leave between 3.15 and 3.30. And this gives us a total of five hours of core instruction. We break up the individual blocks with enrichment and physical activity and lunch so that it's not you're sitting there for almost five hours with straight content being delivered. So we have a very uh, specific targeted schedule to make sure that we're getting that um, we're getting that instructional time in, but we're chunking it with other activities to engage the kids. So the research says that you need to get that five hours in to start seeing <coughs> changes in student achievement. And if you think of it from the point of view of a lot of our core instruction is a 55 to 60 minute block. Within a single day, kids are getting a week of instruction. Uh, so once again, on the digital programming, uh, we stress it is only allowed during the last 30 minutes for independent learning. That isn't to say that they can't use online programming to deliver the lesson or for the in-class support. But we're saying for kids to be doing completely independent learning, we max that out at 30 minutes and it's at a very specific time of day. Um, so um, students can log in with a clever ID as normal and uh, students will be, I don't know if that, students will be able, that's a typo. <laughs> So disregard that last bullet. Uh, the instructional block. Uh, instructional block should continue. <coughs> so we give them examples of best practices. So when we're thinking about that 90-minute block, we're recommending that they always begin each block with an opening activity, that then they provide direct instruction where they share uh, with the students their learning goals or their daily learning objectives for that day. We encourage teachers to do an I do, we do, you do model, where the teacher, I do, I present that information to you or I model that information, then we do it together to make sure that they understand how to do it, and then we give them time for independent practice. So that's the model we encourage them to use. Uh, we also want them to uh, have opportunities for the kids to work collaboratively and engage in that academic dialogue with their peers. We feel like there should be brain breaks within the instruction. There should be frequent opportunities to monitor student progress. And then we ask that they do an exit slip at the end of each instructional block to go back and measure. This is my learning goal for my students. Did they master that or do I need to change my instruction when I get to my next core block? So, it is rigorous instruction, it's timely, it's on grade level. It should uh, include varied activities within the block, uh, opportunities for kids to have academic dialogue and hands-on learning, and very limited stretches of sit and get or completely independent work. We want the kids engaged with the teacher and engaged with one another. So this uh, is an example of a sample schedule and we do ask that the teachers develop lesson plans during that two days of training. And uh, this is what we recommend as far as breaking up the block so that they have multiple uh, activities during that. So, as I said, five hours equals a single day equals one week of regular instruction. So it's highly intense. For our enrichment block, we encourage uh, our teachers to think about uh, activities or hobbies that they enjoy doing and sharing those with the, the students. 
so things that we suggest as possible topics, but all of this is generated by the school and by the teachers. Uh, we mentioned art, uh, music, STEM activities. We have Lego robotics kits. We have K-Mix kits. We have Spiros. Uh, we have Rubik's Cube lessons uh, that can be checked out by the schools and used in those uh, enrichment activities. We also want them doing a physical activity walk. Uh, examples include sports, dance, exercise, but we know we have some kids that maybe don't want to engage in physical activity, but we don't want kids sitting there on a phone or on a device. So uh, alternate activities might be working a puzzle with a, a peer, once again engaging in that dialogue. Uh, they might play card games or they might play board games, but once again, we want kids during summer school engaging with other students and other adults, not you know, sitting there isolated on their phone or on a device. So our staffing plan. Um, we do um, have instructional assistants, we have certified teachers, we have building administrators, we have bus drivers and we have cooks. Um, are, are the, all the different staff roles that help us in delivering this program. So this is our staffing plan. Uh, it is a pre um, through grade 12 program. Uh, so we have a preschool teacher um, per school. Then we have a K-2 reading and a K-2 math. We have a 3-5 reading and a 3-5 math. And then at the high school, uh, we give them the flexibility with those four teachers to fill those roles for credit recovery for those two kids. And then we also have four staff at JCNS, and they have uh, also been incorporating some science and some social studies into that as well. So the staffing plans is really a math as our primary focus, uh, but we have given um, the schools the latitude to address other content areas if they want to. Now, one thing that's uh, special about a vacation academy is that that content in that week is a single content area. Kids aren't going to read math, science, and social studies in a week. They pick an area of focus, and so they do intense instruction in reading for 20 hours. The next week they come back and they can do intense instruction in math. The third week it might be social studies. The fourth week it might be science. And that's what the research says, is that you have to have this intense focused time in a content area in order to see uh, improvement student achievement. So when you see those instructional blocks, kids aren't going reading math, science. They're doing reading all that. But then in the next week, they can roll over into a different content area or they can stay in the same content area if that's where they have a need. So any questions? This is the month of June, is that when It is going to kick off on June 5th, which is a Monday, and run through June 29th, which is a Thursday. And we will provide training to staff the week of uh, Memorial Day. What is the attendance policy? It is completely voluntary. Uh, the principals work uh, and the counselors work with the parents to get them to commit. Sometimes we have parents who can only commit to one week. And so if we can get the kids there in that week and provide that instruction, that's what we do. So, and when it's a week per content area, a parent may say, I'm going to be gone the last two weeks of June. Can they attend reading in week one and math in week two? And so we try to work with the parent. What we really ask for them to do is give us that week. But if, if they don't attend, they don't attend. There isn't a repercussion, I guess, except they lose instruction. And what about if it was, if the student was just able to do half a day, is that an option for them? They could do that. The research says they're not going to make the improvement that they would if they were there for the full day. Right. So that's why we ask parents to commit to that because it's about what the research says will make a difference in that student's learning. 
and that's what we're really pushing. We try to be very flexible with the parents, um, but just letting them be very aware that based on the research, we really need them for those 20 hours that week. How many of you said that? Did they run a bus? Yes, we, per, uh, we have bus drivers, and we provide transportation. And then we've got extra programming going on at the same time. So this is all academic programming. But Save the Children is doing um, summer programming at the key on a, a smaller basis. And then Tyner um, is doing a 21st century programming with Save the Children. And that's in addition to these programs. And SANGAP isn't doing a physical program that they were awarded $15,000 in summer readiness materials for school age and kindergarten ready children. And so those orders, I think, were placed Monday or Tuesday. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we move on to item 2C, the Jackson County High School water break issue response update. Mr. Stephen Gabbard, our director of Wilton and Grants. Well, I'm here for a public service announcement on what to do when you have a water heater break. <laughs> but before we do that, we have a gentleman sitting here with us this evening that is, is uh, just, I mean, he, he has took the reins to help us with our roofing projects, and that's Richard Cunning, and I didn't know he was going to be here, all right? My I must say I appreciate this man. He has made it so easy to get these roofs on these buildings. They're, they're so responsive and, and work so well with the staff. Safety's first and foremost with them, and, and it's just been a wonderful experience. I had no idea he was going to be here. Right? My grandpa. I knew you had a grandchild at yeah. San Gap, but I didn't know you'd be here tonight. <laughs> so we, we want to recognize him. Okay, uh, you all know about the water heater burst at, at the high school, so... We'll, we'll just give you a little quick brief update on what happened. So March 27th, Monday, about 5 in the morning, got a phone call that we had a water heater that had busted on the second floor, had to be the second floor, uh, of the high school. Um, and that resulted in a significant portion of the building, both top and bottom floors, uh, receiving a lot of water intrusion and damage. Um, this particular water heater, it's only about 10 years old. I um, have no idea, but the bottom of it gave out. It had a two inch intake line coming into it. Uh, there's no way that the drain next to it could hold that amount of water. It was just impossible. So, um, we, uh, right here's the actual water heater. Now, this, this picture was taken right after they got the water shut off, but you still see it coming out down here at the bottom. And you can see the amount of water coming out of that thing. So. Uh, we think it happened approximately 4 in the morning. Our, our, our morning custodian got there going on 5 o'clock. Uh, it actually hadn't hit the downstairs yet, we don't think, because he hadn't noticed it, but he just went to get something, come back out and notice water running down the stairs. And then we'll show you a video in a minute of what we walked in, in on. So. <coughs> um, again, approximately 5 a.m. he noticed it, notified Mr. Harris, uh, who then quickly notified the maintenance staff, the superintendent. Uh, our maintenance uh, person, Robert Vaughn, our maintenance supervisor, he arrived as soon as he could get there. He was able to get all the water shut off in the building, uh, but not before several inches of water had impacted both the top and bottom floors. Uh, because of that, no way you can clean all that up, and no, no way to safely have school. We had to make a quick decision to cancel school that day. Uh, within about uh, an hour, we'd already got a hold of our insurance companies and ServPro, who you call. And unfortunately, I learned all this from San Gap about four years ago <laughs> in, in a water disaster that happened there over Christmas break that actually ran a couple days in the building because nobody was there. So I, I learned I learned what to do, unfortunately, from that. And so we had ServPro on notice. So they began getting their team together. They began getting their equipment together. And uh, fortunately, and I want to brag on on. On our, our district custodians and a lot of the uh, staff at the high school who just volunteered to come in. So within about two hours, we had several custodians from across the district, several staff members from the high school, 
uh, maintenance had run and got uh, a lot of our equipment that we were able to procure with COVID. Uh, the Kyvek machines and things, we were able to get those to bring those in there to assist with water cleanup while Servpro was on the way. Okay, so here's, here's a few pictures of some of the damage. You'll see uh, this room right here, and I'll show you a video of it. I mean, it took me probably the most damage downstairs. This is an FMB room. You can see water tiles being impacted. You can see water, some of the ceiling tiles that hit the floor. Uh, water up here in the ceiling. Okay, a few more pictures of tiles fell along certain areas of rooms. This was downstairs in the hallway going back towards the library. So here, here's, I walk in about 5.30. You know, I usually don't take waiter boots since I build them, but I, I was with waiter boots. And, and you, you might, I hope you can see this, but go ahead and we'll, we'll play you a few short videos of what we're looking at. Okay. When you see water, when you see the water falling from the, and the water's not supposed to fall from the ceiling from the school. Unless you've got a lot of dirty kids in the shower or something. <laughs> it's just not supposed to do it. And you go down, this is the, entryway into the library wing. Now I'm a shaky videographer, so. Okay, this is down the first floor. It's all the way down by the cafeteria. We went through that just a little bit, but not too bad. And you can see the women off the floor the water is. Okay. There's a couple other videos. This was the FMD room I was talking about. It, it probably was the room downstairs that took the worst damage, and you can you can see the uh, Ceiling tiles had already caved in and come down on some of that cabinetry in there. Uh, some of the appliances. And that room, that room took it pretty good, unfortunately. Uh, quite a bit. And then this is the second floor. One area of concerns right here, that's the elevator shaft. Okay, and water, water did get down to the elevator shaft. And again, the top floor was, was fairly inundated by the time we were able to read that science room. That's Mr. Harris and his Crocs. <laughs> <laughs> and you can kind of see how deep the water is up there. And if you look right here as we start going down this hallway, we, we, here's a was concerned that that's rust probably from the bottom of that water here. Again, it's just 10 years old. Nothing's made like it used to be, unfortunately. So there's just a few short videos of, of some of the things we discovered. So in terms of a short-term response, insurance and serve pro were contacted to bring in specialized equipment. Uh, we had to have electrical inspections because it's very unsafe to walk around water with electrical. They happened the same day. We were fortunate to get people there probably within three hours they were there doing inspections. Plumbing inspection, same day. I uh, did run into uh, some of the HVAC systems on the first floor, so we had to have all the fire dampers, uh, the units, some of the units that have water that possibly impact them, and, and all the duct work on that suspected area inspected. That was done within a week, fortunately. Fortunately, we didn't have water get into anything but a little bit of uh, insulation in the duct. We were very fortunate with that. Uh, fire systems had to be inspected, and they were all, all cleared and online within a week. Uh, technology inspections, Cameron was up there not long after I was, and he was looking at uh, all the servers. Uh, fortunately, again, uh, 
the Lord was looking over us, so I just tell you. Didn't hit our servers, okay? Um, energy controls, it didn't hit those. Uh, the elevator pit had a little water in it. It had to be drained, and we had to have that inspected. That was all done within a week. And then within, uh, I think the third day after it happened fourth, we had our insurance adjuster that came out and walked the building with us uh, to see what was going to have to be done in terms of insurance claims. Okay. We had a very quick response in terms of these. I mean, this is morning time. There's not a lot of people up and at it. This is morning time. Uh, we had a very quick response by maintenance, custodians, and staff volunteers. And I will tell you this, from Sand Gap, the biggest thing that happened to us at Sand Gap is we lost the floor. And we had to have so much, you remember that, we had to have so much of that floor replaced up there. It was, it was horrible. We had to work for months getting that thing put back together. It looks right now, everything is looking good. That, well, that, that saved the vast majority of the flooring, which is a huge thing. That's huge, okay? We also uh, saved most of the cabinetry. We've got just a little bit that's probably going to have to be addressed. But some of the custom work work where the, where the trophies are, are located, uh, upstairs in the science rooms, uh, they really thought that the quick response and the quick dehumidification of the building saved most of that. Uh, Serve Pro did come in and set up a dehumidification system, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute throughout the building. That what they call baked the building for several days to remove any excess moisture and prevent mold. And then uh, the elevator company also told us that they only located about a half an inch of water in that pit, which they were amazed by. And they really thought that was because of the quick response. So we, we were very fortunate there because that could have been very expensive. Here's some server pro equipment. Again, you got your industrial dehumidifier fans sitting all over the place. They brought in trailer loads of those. Those were all over the building. This big machine right here was impressive. That's what they brought in to set up on the side of the school. You'll see the, the vents coming out of it. Those were hung through the hallways. That pumped heat in, sucked it out, and dried the building very quickly. Okay, and up here, and it's hard to see in the pictures, but you kind of see the, the plastic tubing that's going down the the halls through there that's doing that. That takes about three days. That's the reason we had to cancel school at high school for a week. You just could not bring kids in with all that. It was the right thing to do. Okay, a longer term response that we're having to look at. We still have some ceiling tile. You lost, you noticed a lot of ceiling tile. And we actually had, oh, about half of what they needed in, in stock here. And believe it or not, it's, I'm, <laughs> we've got a supply chain issue with ceiling tile right now. The particular ceiling tile we have to get uh, is, is on back order and we're just waiting on it. Well, there were some strobes in the fire alarm that are going to have to be uh, replaced as soon as insurance approves it. That's a, more of a precautionary thing uh, just to prevent future uh, issues. Right now it's working fine. There was one panel that they were, uh, one electrical panel, which was very fortunate is just one that, that probably had some breakers we're going to replace just to be on the safe side. Um, some lighting, have a little bit of lighting in that first floor we're going to replace. Uh, there are a little bit, there is again some cabinetry that the insurance must approve to replace. Um, contents, we were fortunate we didn't have a lot of contents that were lost. We did have some. That has to go through the claim process, that has to be processed through insurance. And uh, we're working with that right now. Uh, the water heater actually was replaced yesterday. So we're back on we're back in operation on that Friday. Friday it was replaced Friday, and uh, all's well there. And of course, we're working with our insurance company on financial reimbursements from this time. And uh, otherwise, that's that's it. All right, that's uh, any questions for me? That's okay. how to handle a water break. <laughs> are they concerns like you have multiple water heaters there? There are multiple water heaters. So mm -hmm. it's purchased all at the same time. They probably they? were. Yeah, there's no way of knowing. I know exactly what you're going to say. There's really no way of knowing. I mean, we're at the mercy of the the, the guts inside. What about, is there any kind of alarm or anything that would, would let people know? There, well, there, the motion sensors haven't detected the, the water, probably because the, the custodian might have got there before it started dripping down in that first floor. Uh, if it's just on the ground level, there's, there's not a lot you can do with that. There might be some technology out there today that will throw, throw a flow sensor out. I'm not, I'm not sure of that. 
But that would be good to have those. I'll tell you that. Really good. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you for being here today. D, 2023-24 school year school calendar presentation. Before we do that, uh, Cameron, could you shoot the preschool flyer up and I'll just briefly go through it. It's getting the time of year that we actually do our preschool and Head Start screening, so I'll just do this for informational purposes. But our preschool and Head Start screening will be at Sun Gap Elementary on Friday, May 5th, and also Friday, May 19th. And that's for four-year-olds on May 5th, three-year-olds on May 19th, and that will be at the Sun Gap Community Outreach Building, if you want to go down to where the grid is. If we go to McKee Elementary, four-year-olds will be on Friday, April 28th. Three-year-olds are on Wednesday, May 17th, and that'll be here at the Jackson County Board of Education presentation room, or what used to be the band room, straight across the hallway. And Tyler Elementary, also four-year-olds are on Monday, May 15th. Three-year-olds are on Tuesday, May the 23rd, and that's also here at the Jackson County Board of Education presentation room, again, straight across the hallway. If you have any questions, you can contact Ms. Lama Freeman, our preschool coordinator here at the board office at 606-287-7181. Again, Ms. Londa Freeman, 287-7181. So any questions about that? Okay, we'll look at our 23-24 calendar. And this did go through our calendar committee process. I'll just briefly go through this. Okay, we start off on Monday the 7th with our opening day. As we've done in many years in the past, we had a planned day right after opening. That gives our teachers and staff an opportunity to prepare. It also gives a very short school week on that first week. If we go down to September the 1st, that's our Jackson County Fire Day. That's something we've done probably the last four or five years where we work with the county fire board and it's worked pretty well. Labor Day, obviously, on the board. We go down to October, fall break. We have a Flex PD Day on the 7th. I'm sorry, on the 5th. And on the 6th of break day, all the PD has been completed. This is just a placeholder for the calendar. Again, all the professional development, professional learning has been completed at this point. And this is just a placeholder of the calendar. You actually have to have four PDs or the equivalent to what Ms. North's 24 hours. Yeah. Okay, if we move on down to November, we have a flex PD a day again on the 6th. And that's really hard for me to see, so I'll do the best I can with the numbers. On the 7th, we have election day. We do have Tyre Elementary that will be used as a public place. It's my understanding, Daniel, that San Gap will also be used as a public place this November. So by law, you cannot have school, you cannot have kids in the building when a school is used for a public place. So again, that's election day. If we go down to Thanksgiving break, just like we've always done in the past, there's your third flex PD, your holiday, and a break day. If you go down to December, we have the full two weeks of Christmas vacation like we've always done. We'll scroll back up to January. And the calendar falls really well this year. The first is actually on Monday, so the kids would return on Tuesday, January the 2nd. Martin Luther King Day. We move down to February. There's no breaks in February. Obviously, we would probably have a snow day or have a virtual learning day, NPI day during that period. We go to March. There's a flex PD day, and that's actually CKEA day. That's our fourth flex PD, PD day and final flex PD day. April, just like we've done this past year, we have a full week of spring break, which is great. I'm glad we can build that in again. Then we go down to May. And the last day for students is on the 15th. If you see the M's, that's for makeup days. There's election day as well on the 21st, I believe. Makeup days are just days that are required to be built in the calendar, and that's the highest number of inclement weather days that were used in the past five years. So I think that's 14. The most days we've missed in the past five years would be 14. So that's a requirement by KDE that has to be built in. Overall, we have 174 instructional days, four holidays, four flex PD days, one planned day, one open day, and one closed day. Uh, everybody except the middle school is on quarters, and we have those broken probably about as close as you can break for grading periods. 44 in the first, 44 in the second, 43 in the third, 43 in the fourth, and the middle school quarters, we've got those broken evenly at 58 days each. So that's a good calendar that has actually gone through the calendar committee process, and uh, I'll answer any questions that anyone may have at this point. Okay, thank you. 
item 2E, personnel and substitute report. As always, that's enclosed as an attachment for your review. With communications being completed, I'll turn the meeting over to Chairman Neely with item number 3. Item number 3, approval of bills for claims. Need a motion? Motion. Second. Second. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Allen? Yes. Yes, for me. Item number 4, approval of the minutes from the March 21, 2023 regular board meeting. Need a motion? Motion. Second. Second. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Allen? Yes. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Item number five, approval of the 2023 Jackson County Public Schools Summer Success Academy Framework Plan. Need a motion? Motion. Need a second? Second. Ms. Allen? Yes. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Ms. Nichols? Yes. Yes, for me. <clears throat> Item six, approval of the Statement of Authority uh, NSLP, that's an indirect cost pro, uh, prop, procurement. procurement, I'll get you out here in a minute, certified in, in the public in the community eligibility provision CEP eligible criteria and free implement steps for the Jackson County Public School System Food Service Program. Need a motion? I'll make a motion. Need a second? Second. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Allen? Yes. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, item seven, approval of the new security camera system for the Jackson County High School. I'll let Stephen help me because he's still here if I forget yeah. something. But two years ago, we did a new security camera system for San Gabriel Elementary in the Jackson County Middle School. It's an NVR and it has high definition cameras. Uh, this year, we did it for McKee Elementary and Tyler Elementary. I think they work really well. What's your opinion on that? Well, I know the new camera system. Uh, overall, they're really good. I mean, they're clear. You can, you can see really well. On. So this will finish our district-wide initiative by adding a new camera system to the Jackson County High School. It'll have new NDR, state-of-the-art. It'll also have the high-definition cameras, just like we put in at the other schools. It does increase the capacity. I think currently the capacity of the high school is 96. And it is the high school and also the ATC. This, with the four NDRs, will give us increased capacity of 128 cameras. So we can add actually 32 cameras if needed. And my philosophy, and Stephen's heard me say this many times, you can't have too many cameras. A little update on our school bus cameras. Those will be done at the end of the year. We've already made arrangements uh, for that to happen. We've got completed 20 buses over Christmas break, and we have 20 more buses we'll complete as soon as uh, you know, the end of the year is up. So anything, Mr. Gabbard, you'd like to add about the security cameras? No, I mean, like I said, it's going to increase the amount that we, we have capability of, of doing there at the high school. And, gives us a little bit better access to them as well uh, and quicker access uh, to seeing those. Based on what we've had from the other schools, those, those high, high, high definition cameras really improve the quality and we can pick up on a lot of stuff. So. We, we look forward to doing this project for the high school. Need a motion? Mm -hmm. Second. Second. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Heisman? Item 8, approval of 2023 Jackson County Public School Summer Feeding Program. Ms. Dooley will publicize, this, publicize all this later pending board approval, but it actually will go tentatively from June the 5th through July the 14th. It also works in conjunction with our Summer Success Academy. So we always have great, partition, great participation with our summer feeding program and, and look forward to doing that uh, across the district as well again this summer. Any motion? Motion. Second. Ms. Allen? Yes. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Ms. Item 9, approval of the results planning process addendum to agree between the partners for rural impact and the Jackson County Board of Education. This is a little bit unusual. It has no impact whatsoever on our Bureau grant. It pertains to the Bureau grant, which is at the Jackson County High School, the budget, the program, and it has zero impact. It's just something on the other side. And basically, Partners for Rural Impact was affiliated with Berea College. They were like an arm or extension of Berea College through last year. The board actually approved this agreement in August of 2022. At that time, they were still affiliated with Berea. 
now that there's separation, so all this document does is it's an addendum to the original agreement, which was board approved in August, took effect October 1st. It's just an addendum that would create separation between Berea College and Partners for Real Impact. Partners for Real Impact will be its own entity. So again, it has no impact whatsoever on us. It's just what I would call a, a clear and legal separation document. Anything you'd add, Ms. Norris? No. Accurate. Okay. Need a motion? Second. 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 Motion. Second. 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 Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Yes. Item 11, approval to, to declare the following as surplus, surplus property. You want to talk about it? If you'll shoot that on the screen, Cameron, I'll just quickly go through it. But pending board approval, uh, we'll start advertising this on Tuesday, April 25th. We do it in the newspaper as required. We also put it on our Facebook and any other avenue we can. So as many people as possible can see it. The closing time of bid will be on Tuesday, May the 9th at 9 o'clock, and that's when I assume Mr. Gabbard will do the bid opening. So this year we have a 2008 Chevy Impala. We have assorted uh, scrap metal. We have a bush hog, which is actually located at the high school football field. We have brake drums, which are located at the bus garage, assorted used tires, John Deere reel mower, small scraper blade, assorted size wooden and metal doors, and some wooden pallets. So all this will be advertised pending board approval, and uh, then we'll do our usual process on it. Anything to add, Mr. Kevin? No, I'm pretty standard. We have, we have about once a year. We have a lot of stuff we have to get rid of. Okay, thank you. Need a motion? Motion. Second. Second. Ms. Allen? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Yes. Item number 12, approval to submit the application for non-traditional construction day for 2023-2024 school year pending KDA review and approval. Do you have a motion? Motion. Do you have a second? Second. Ms. Allen? Yes. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Nicholson? Item 13, approval to of the amended 2022 and 2023 school Okay, I'll just quickly go through how we're going to close the year out. And this, if you want to go to the end right after spring break, Cameron, in April. Okay, we just have gotten back from spring break approximately a little over a week ago, and there that is. We go through, and the last day for students will be the 25th, which is on a Thursday. Closing day for staff will be on the 26th, which is on a Friday. I've talked to Dr. Kirby. He plans on having the middle school promotion here at the Central Office Gymnasium on the 25th at 8.30. Special event. I always enjoy going. And graduation will be on the 27th for the high school. So we actually close the year out. The last day for students will be on the 25th. Election day, as we said earlier, we have two schools that will be used as polling places. And uh, there that is on the 16th. And our KSA testing windows the last 14 days, Kentucky Sun Assessment, or what I call Kentucky State Assessment, and that's the last 14 days of instruction. Correct, Ms. Norris? It, uh, yes, it opens on May 5th, is the actual official day because we have to take that election day out. Okay. So that's the way we finish the year up. We're very fortunate. We get out in May. We've had several breaks along the way, including two weeks of Christmas, a full spring break. And that gives us plenty of time for everybody to rest up prior to our summer academy, which would start on June the 5th. We finished the year with 174 instructional days, four holidays, four flex PD days, one plan, one opening, one closing for a total of 185 days. Any questions about the way, any question about the way we close the school year out as far as the school calendar? Okay, thank you. Motion. Motion. Second. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Ms. Allen? Yes. Item 14, approval to the request emergency days for the Jackson County High School for the dates of March 28, 29, 30, 31st, 2023. 
Need a motion? Motion. Second. Second. Ms. Allen? Yes. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Item 15, approval of the proposal owner contract agreement, BG number 22-313, this Lewis, Lewis Brothers Incorporated pending ADE review and approval. And then item 16, we've got approval of the proposed owner contract agreement, BG number 23-154, with the Bride Den Company Incorporated pending KDE review and approval. And then item 17, we've got a, a approval of a memorandum of agreement with the Midway University Teachers Education Program in the Jackson County Board of Education. And then three items, 15, 16, 17, need a motion? Any, any questions? Any questions, anybody? Need a motion on those three items? Motion. Second. Second. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Ms. Allen? Yes. Yes, you may. Item 18, approval of the financial service agreement with the Pitney Bowes. Need a motion? Motion. Need a second? Second. Ms. Allen? Yes. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Yes, you may. Item 19, approval of the Jackson County Public Schools Comprehensive District Improvement. Need a motion? Need a motion. Need a second? Second. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Ms. Allen? Yes. Yes, you may. Item 20, approval to, to establish and reestablish positions. Need a motion? Motion. Need a second? Second. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Ms. Allen? Yes. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Yes, you may. Item 20, report approval of fundraisers. Need a motion? Motion. Need a second? Second. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Allen? Yes. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Yes, you may. Item 22, approval of field trips. Need a motion? Motion. Need a second? Second. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Ms. Allen? Yes. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Yes, you may. Item 23, there was no one signed in on the public comment. Correct. On item 24, approval of bid hearing. Need a motion? Motion. Need a second? Second. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Allen? Yes. Ms. Heisman? Yes. Yes, you may.